Welcome back to Crime After Crime. It's December 1st, and I am John Lorden. <laughs> it's December 1st, and I am John Lorden. It's the news reports. <laughs> and I am Danielle Hallen. Welcome back. Welcome back to the <laughs> 6 o'clock news. We just survived another Thanksgiving weekend, which, believe it or not, is actually a feat in itself. Okay, I'm going to stop doing the news It reporter. really is, though. It, what seriously. if we just just that should be our you know april fool's joke do it just, <laughs> just like a news newscast. report the entire yeah. episode <laughs> <laughs> i don't uh, get how i still after years of being in the social media space doing things similar to what some people mm -hmm. do on their news reports i still don't get that delivery patter i still don't get like it's i don't know where did that come from who thought i don't know it does get your attention, though. In, in a way, it does. But I imagine, you know, like uh, hearing a news report while you're standing mm -hmm. in a crowded train station somewhere. Like it would it would stick out just because the pattern of speech is so yeah. different and odd. And um, but in terms of the reality of like talking about someone that's facing a, a tragedy or having some type of ordeal they're going through. Yeah, not a fan of it. I don't know why this is the preferred way to talk about it. And no has clue. been for decades. And there's what kills me, Danielle, is seeing people that have now come up in a age of social media, uh, and they're still doing they're doing the same thing. Mm -hmm. Like I'll see yeah. these you know twenty yep. year old newscasters doing the exact same thing, reporting Why live from thing? the scene. How do they do it? You know, know that's kind of what impresses me the most. I'm like, how did, did you just wake up? Like what? No, yeah, I think you there's a class. And you perfect it. No, I think there's a class. Someone's <laughs> teaching this. I don't. <laughs> I don't know. The Walter Probably. Cronkite School of Broadcast. I don't know. <laughs> it's so weird. Oh my gosh. Oh, but I guess we better get back on topic. Okay, look, yeah. guys. <laughs> we we have survived newscasters. And we've also survived Thanksgiving weekend. We have. Why are we saying that? Because several sources actually call Thanksgiving the most dangerous holiday of the year. This is no joke. Yeah. Yeah. You guys, food poisoning, okay? Allergies and scary. This is the scariest one to me. Heart attacks are some of the risks. Now, the American Heart Association found that an unusually heavy meal can increase the risk of a heart attack by about four times, okay? And just the two hours after eating. I'm scared. <laughs> I'm scared too. That's I'm, so scary. I'm pretty sure I, I ran a test of that over this past Thanksgiving. See? Because man, yeah. I wonder why. I don't know, I don't know. But yeah, uh, four times the risk in the two hours after eating. Mm. Uh, of course, another big factor we've talked about on the channel here over the years, drinking and driving. The 4th of mm -hmm. July and Thanksgiving are practically tied for the top spot mm -hmm. in terms of fatalities, according to the American Safety Council. And of course, we have a few more holidays that come up on that list. Two of them in this month, New Year's Day. And, well, I guess New Year's Day is actually next month, but New Year's Eve. Uh, and Christmas round out the top four. Yeah, so you guys, please, please, okay, get that designated driver in place. It's so important. And also be sure to buckle up. More than half of those fatalities involve people not wearing their seatbelts. Two seconds, you guys. That's something you can do so quickly to protect yourself. Yeah, I can't believe that stat. I, the, the one that I saw, I think mm -hmm. it was 60% of those fatalities oh my involved people not wearing safety belts. Like, I just, I can't imagine that we still have that here, but we do. Mm. It's just a little public safety message for everyone out yeah. there for the people that we care about the most so we we hope that you guys will will hear that and put it into play for yourselves just like we will now we need to get ready to dive into the most dangerous aspect of thanksgiving in my mm. opinion yeah <laughs> black friday crimes part two but before that a few quick things first of all the polls for your favorite past episodes where we've been asking for the past couple months for you guys to go fill that out those polls are now closed all right hundreds of you voted and we have our top three picks drum roll <laughs> so in third place world's worst alibi Ooh, going mm -hmm. back to world's worst alibi yep. yeah I'm excited about that <laughs> i am too because i know there's more stories than the ones that that we went for mm -hmm. originally uh in second place 
we're going to have another round of craziest evidence. And that's going to be a good one. For some reason, that episode in particular has always stuck out in my mind. Yeah. I think it's just because it's like you learn something new and it sounds so unbelievable. It's absolutely crazy. But the number one pick, which does not at all surprise me, <laughs> is craziest getaway. No, I know it doesn't surprise her because she wanted to do it just a few months ago. She was trying yeah. to talk me into doing another episode <laughs> of Craziest Getaway. So Yeah, so yeah. for those of you who voted that, I have been on your side <laughs> this whole time. <laughs> I'm telling you, absolutely love it. And so all of these episodes will be sprinkled in with several more other original topics over this last season. So yeah, a lot of good times. As excited as I am to hit those topics again... We've also got some great suggestions from you guys, and we're pulling from that list. One that I'm ex especially excited about, smelliest crimes. You would be, John. It, isn't it great? <laughs> you would be. It's such that. a great idea. We can go so many different directions with that. I have no idea. I'm so nervous. <laughs> oh, it's going to be amazing, Danielle. You'll see. You'll see. Uh, all right. Look, it's time to see what happened with the results for our last episode last month. Danielle told the story of a man who was in love, and he wouldn't let the bars of a jail cell keep him from his love. I told the story of a man who was in love with escaping from jail, with five escapes each. I wasn't sure how the audience was going to go with this, but boy, they found a clear winner. How did it play out, Danielle? You guys, I don't even want to like say these results because I've already told John I don't believe them. <laughs> I think something's off, but he's very confident. It's a scientific poll. We have two separate <laughs> yeah. sources and they almost match. So this is legit. So on Twitter, I received 91% of the votes and John received nine. And it's essentially the? the exact same thing on the website poll. 89% for my story and 11% for John. Y'all, listen. I love taking a win in this podcast. I really do. I swear something's up with that. No, it's, it's lit. Well, I have a theory. You want to hear my theory? I would love to hear your theory because I feel wrong taking this mug. <laughs> I do. I have a theory. I think it had to do with a little speech. I, I went back. I listened to the whole episode and I found a little speech in particular and I think it tilted it for you. It's the part where you talked about that I was telling you how good my story was and how you were intimidated. Ah. So before we continue with this episode, <laughs> I just want to let you guys know. Oh, no. <laughs> Danielle has been harassing me. I've been getting texts in the middle of the night <laughs> saying, John, you're going to lose in such a big way this month. And she wasn't even talking about last month. She's talking about this next one. <laughs> She said, my story is so good. And John, you're a complete failure. Oh, and yeah. I'm like, I totally Danielle, it's did. not nice. It's not nice to speak that way. But she wouldn't I, stop. I wouldn't. <laughs> there was phone calls. Uh, she had a dozen dead roses delivered to my door. I don't even get that. Um, so I don't know. I just, just want to let you guys know the, the truth of what happens here uh, as we're trying to produce this show. <laughs> But I got to tell scary you, background, I'm telling you, I'm for, evil. <laughs> for getting 10% of the audience votes, like I really, I feel like I should have just slept. Like it should have been, okay, now it's time for John's story. <laughs> I'm pretty sure I could have still gotten 10%. I'm just about choked on my teeth. <laughs> no, I, I don't know. I'm convinced something's not right with that. I mean, I thought my story was great, but I thought both of our stories are great. And I did not walk away from that saying, oh yeah, smoked him. Uh, I think what won, honestly, what I think won it is the character, the, oh, the type of person that you were talking about versus <laughs> yep. the type of person that I was talking mm -hmm. about. Um, there was something very endearing about the story that you were telling. Mm -hmm. And mine was just, Hey, this guy's trying to escape out of prison. And I had good detail about his, oh, absolutely. his methods. Like I loved that crazy. aspect of it, but the humanity of why you would escape from prison was mm -hmm. way different for your story. Like, you know, it's this guy's in love. And even when, you know, his first partner passes away, he's yeah. in love with someone else. Like, it's just his motivation. Mm -hmm. uh, our guy in my story, I never really understood what his motivation was outside of he's former military and he just likes escaping prisons. Yeah. Um, so, Danielle, well. I, I will very happily hand over the crime after crime mug. Here you go. It changed da, 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 da. on the handover, but there we go. It did. It's um, okay. It did. And in, <laughs> instead, because now I can't have my tea in that mug that I handed you, 
the oh, Lucucci Florida. Breaking out the Lucucci mug. Yep. I got the Lucucci mug, so everything's fine That's over here. That's fantastic. And I'm still jealous. I <laughs> <laughs> will always and forever be jealous of that mug, but one day. One day. I'll visit there specifically to buy a mug. <laughs> Maybe I'll bring this mug to the um, to the Florida mm. show. I feel like you have. Oh, <gasps> John, you have to do that. Right? Yeah. We'll have it part of the photo op. You can choose. You either get a Fantastic. picture with the trophy or mm -hmm. the Lucucci mug. <laughs> Which has like absolutely no connection to like anything ever. No. <laughs> and it's fantastic. I love it. Yeah. And I hope someone looks back at that picture and like 25 years from now and is like, Yeah, why are you? What? <laughs> who? Why did I take a picture with this mug? <laughs> <laughs> oh, just here to confuse people. <laughs> All right. Yep. Speaking of. Let's get into more stories. Why not? Yeah. Today, mm -hmm. we're looking for more Black Friday crimes. The last time we went down this rabbit hole, we came back severely traumatized with yep. bruises, a black eye, and ripped clothing. But we got that amazing deal on an Xbox One. Oh, absolutely. So this time, we had to dig even deeper to pull out two great stories for today's episode. It was no easy task, you guys, when I tell you. <laughs> we dug deep. We went in there. But it was still a lot easier than sleeping on the concrete in front of a Best Buy on Thanksgiving night. Yeah, it's not fun. Let's no. get it started with the knockout king from last episode, Danielle uh, Hallen. Crowd cheers in the background. Can she repeat right. it? Let's see. <laughs> I'm going to try. I don't know. I will tell you guys one thing. Black Friday has changed a lot, which I feel like we're going to dabble in a little bit. So with sales pretty much being held all month long now, and with the ever-growing convenience of having goods shipped to your door, I genuinely do feel like the thrill of it all has kind of started to wear off. I went to Target. Nobody was there. <laughs> really? Nobody. I'm so serious. And, I mean, things were still fully stocked. There was just nothing happening. Yeah. I was only there for like 30 minutes, and it was later on, but still. But what's interesting about this is that Instead, I feel like something has taken its place. You don't see the typical crimes as often as you do. Things like, you know, people being trampled and fights over TVs and video game consoles. So apparently in the past handful of years, organized crime within retailers has become a lot more prevalent. And not just on Black Friday, which is definitely something that happens, but just throughout the holidays in general. I feel like Black Friday just creates this very unique opportunity for criminals because despite retailers' attempts to organize the chaos, it's still chaos. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so, so much can slip under the radar. For instance, this year alone, Target has lost, get this, $400 million in organized retail crime. Ooh, like basically, you know, taking things off the truck and out of the, uh -huh. yep. uh, out of the shipping dock. Wow, wow. And they projected that between Black Friday through the rest of the year, they would lose another 200 million. So half of what they lost in 11 months, they plan to lose in just that one, just over a month time period. Wow, wow. And we also saw the past couple of years, and me and John had already kind of spoken about this um, earlier in a private conversation, that there are these new like smash and grabs or what else did they call them? Like flash mobs, like just yeah, groups like of people flash. showing up and running exactly. in. Exactly. Yeah. And we've seen a lot of those the past couple of years. I think there was actually one in Memphis, just this was the closest one to me, I believe, where 20 people came in and ransacked a store stealing $100,000 in merchandise. And so there's actually been a lot of changes in security and things in retail around Black Friday and the holidays. There's even an organized retail crime task force. It's a mouthful. <laughs> but back in 2012, that wasn't a thing. Completely different world. Most of those steps weren't being taken. Now, to take you back in time a little bit, in 2012, <laughs> there were great deals on Fitbits, <laughs> PlayStation 3s. Ooh. <laughs> I know, getting fancy. Yeah. Keurigs, like when Keurig yes. coffee machines were like the best thing in the world. And get this iPhone 5s, <laughs> there were deals on iPhone 5s. Mm -hmm. People were just in a shopping frenzy. And while organized crime, how we see it today during Black Friday was not the largest concern, there were a few people ahead of the game. 
So this brings us to Black Friday that year. The Target store on Springfield Avenue in Union, New Jersey had opened its doors for the very first time ever on Thanksgiving Day. I'm sure all you guys remember this too. It used to be you did sleep on the concrete out front of Best Buy, but mm -hmm. now they're like, you know what? Typically we open at midnight. However, right. if we open up at 9 p.m. to pie fueled shoppers, <laughs> yeah, we're bound up our sales. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they're like, all these people are running off a turkey and you're like, sugary gelatinous cranberry sauce bring them in <laughs> <laughs> and they weren't wrong the entire night at that target went swimmingly there were no incidents that occurred and the same thing trickled into the following day but by late that friday night just as black friday was coming to a close a plan was executed by a group of thieves now while some black friday thieves most of them actually that you see prefer the ability to slip merchandise into their bag or their cart and just sneakily head out of the store unnoticed you know, hiding behind the mob of people in there, this group had much larger and much riskier plans. 28-year-old Marilyn Wiggins drove his car to the Union Target in Springfield Avenue in New Jersey with three of his closest friends. Now, upon arriving to the Target, I believe it was shortly after 9 p.m., they navigated through the sea of cars and people walking out with their full carts, and 23-year-old Darrell Carter and 35-year-old Daquan Vaughn hopped out of the car and made their way into the store. And this is about 9.47. Now, leaving Marilyn Wiggins with the fourth person in the group, which was 28-year-old Lavelle Jones. But Carter and Vaughn had absolutely no intentions of shopping. They didn't plan on snagging that newest iPhone 5 <laughs> or a scam of a deal on a television. Don't even get me started on that. They wanted the top deal of all. Both men were very familiar with the store, so they beelined it through all of the last-minute shoppers to the employee bathroom that was tucked away in an unlocked side hallway. I know, right? Black Friday, Target, go to the bathroom. Yeah. This would be the least visited location in the store at the time mm -hmm. and was the perfect place to hide out. Now, shortly after Carter and Vaughn had made their way into the bathroom, suddenly Lavelle Jones walks all by himself into the Target. But just like Carter and Vaughn, he had other plans. He began to wander around the Target aimlessly, attempting to fit in with the other shoppers. But instead of having his eye out for deals, he was keeping an eye out for law enforcement. Meanwhile, Liggins, the driver, had driven the car to a portion of the shoulder off of Route 78 that backed right up to the target. And you guys, I looked at this at Google Maps, <laughs> and when I say right behind, I mean you could probably do like one of those like elementary school long jumps from the highway <laughs> to the fence that's right there and right on the other side's the parking lot. And so for the next hour, they had nothing to do but patiently wait. They didn't have plans of snagging a TV from another shopper's cart or start a fight with a customer over the last box of whatever materialistic object was on sale. They were going to rob the Target cash room right at closing. Ooh. Now, this Target <clears throat> had just opened? It hadn't it hadn't just opened. It was the first time they were opening like on Thanksgiving night. So they had oh, okay, been Okay, okay. This was the first like extended Black Friday experience. I think Gotcha. gotcha. Cuz like around this time I think stores like had been opening at, like 4 a.m. and then they pushed it back to where they would open at midnight and then I think yeah. it was like right after they did that they were like, "Uh, eh, we'll just open Thanksgiving night." And there were like all those protests that happened. I don't know if you remember that. Um I just so, I love this whole aspect of thinking about staging this crime for the end of friday because of yeah. how much cash mm. is going to be at the location exactly. then exactly and it's also got me wondering like does loomis run their trucks on black friday like do i they have do... never seen a loomis truck yeah do they before do on a black friday do they do cash pickups then or are they just leaving it at these locations that's wow interesting exactly because, I mean, while the goods were definitely something of great value, and, like, lots of people do that. They go in there, grab a TV, fill their whole cart up, and they leave, and they've got, you know, like, maybe a thousand, two thousand $2,000 in items. Yeah. Um, the amount of money that this Target had likely racked in over the last 24 hours, especially because this was something new and exciting for people. It's like, I don't know, people just get this mentality during Black Friday and they're like, oh my gosh, they're opening Thanksgiving night. This is so new and crazy as if like three, four hours makes any difference. And so they were just raking in the money and that was going to be a much larger amount than anything they could steal in items. Yeah, yeah. So finally at 11 to 1 p.m., part two of the plan went into action. So Carter and Vaughn had a visitor in the employee bathroom, a completely unsuspecting poor victim. <laughs> 
Uh-oh. I feel so bad for this employee. So as the store was closing up for the night, this employee, you know, finally had a bit of a break, stumbled into the bathroom, hoping, you know, for relief. It's probably been an incredibly long and difficult shift, only to find a gun in their face. Carter and Vaughn demanded that this employee put their hands behind their back. They then subdued the employee using zip ties and encouraged them to think of their family when it came to their next actions. And so Carter and Vaughn proceeded to tell this employee about their intentions, demanded to know the access code to that secured hallway that led to the cash room. And at that same moment, around 11 p.m., just as they're ambushing this employee, suddenly Jones, who's been wandering around the store for this whole hour, takes his few items, proceeds to check out. I guess his job for looking for security guards and police had ended in his mind, and so he slipped out of the store to wait and help out Carter and Vaughn once they hopefully were able to get their hands on the cash. Now, I'm not saying that (laughs) if I were a criminal, I'd do things different, but that part doesn't make sense to me. (laughs) Like, why would you leave probably one of the most critical moments in watching out the store? But regardless... He left. So finally, at around 11.16 p.m., the duo managed to get the code off of this Target employee and took him as a hostage out of the bathroom. Mm. Now, luckily for them, most of the other employees at this point were busy helping gather carts. They were cleaning up the dozens and dozens of messes that I'm sure were all over the place, closing down the store so nobody seemed to notice. Now, after entering the code, they made their way down the secured hallway, and of course, the cash room was securely locked as well. I don't really know what... This seems like a very like well thought out plan, but at the same time, yeah. yeah, aspects of it are just not making sense. So instead, they decided to hide in a nearby utility room to wait for that final round of money to be gathered from the cash register and dropped off in the room for the night. And it didn't take long as these exhausted employees just wanted to go home. Oh, yeah. So at around 11, 28 p.m., another unsuspecting victim made their way down the secured hallway with a cart filled with cash. Now, as this employee starts to unlock the cash room, out jump Carter and Vaughn. And yet again, they're aiming their guns straight at the employee and basically demanded, you know, lie down or you're in trouble and subdued this individual with zip ties. And now all of this Black Friday cash right at their fingertips. The door is open. I mean, they didn't even have to like work hard to do it either. Now, for one reason or another, Carter and Vaughn suddenly became worried about surveillance cameras in the cash room. Okay. I'm sure we've all been to Target. I mean, their entirety of their trip from the beginning to end, other than when they're in the bathroom, has been seen this whole time. But they all of a sudden were in a panic, you know? And so they attempted, keyword attempted, to knock out the security cameras, but their efforts fell short. And knowing that they were running low on time, they went ahead with the robbery anyways and piled over $50,000 into bags from the safe. Once they had cleared out the target of as much money as they could, they proceeded to run from the target to Liggins and Jones, who were waiting in the car just off the side of Route 78, and off into the night they went. Meanwhile, those two poor employees are still tied up. Mm. They had remained zip tied in the hallway for I couldn't find an exact time, but they basically had to figure out a way to get themselves out. Like nobody came down there for anything and it wasn't until they were able to get those zip ties off and go run for help that anyone knew what had even happened at this point those men are long gone so union police were called to the scene right away um, and i'm sure they already had dealt with who knows how many other crazy things that night and they immediately went to the um, massive surveillance system they're like you know maybe we can catch who was responsible like there's way too many cameras in target yeah. to not catch someone and the security footage ended up capturing both carter and vaughn entering the store immediately heading to the bathroom shortly followed by jones i mean there's outdoor cameras too that saw the car that they were getting and out of like the whole entire thing i mean jones entire time walking around the target I mean, for an hour, that was all captured, and you can see him very clearly taking or making multiple phone calls throughout that time. And it became clear this wasn't just something random some shopper decided to do. This was an organized robbery, which, I mean, I guess like in retail, like large retail situations like this, it's not as common as you would think it is. Yeah. 
Yeah. Which is crazy to me. But so their investigation led the team to search all around the area for any evidence of how the group had left because cameras had seen them get out of a car to go into the target, but they didn't get another car to leave. They just kind of ran around to the side of the target. And so they followed the route that this group likely took and it led them to the fence right along the clearing, like going towards the highway. And they had clearly left in a hurry and a panic because they had left a broken fence behind and a big bag of money. <laughs> <laughs> I don't wow. even know. <clears throat> Just, man. And they seemed so confident, too. And you would think after waiting all that time that they wouldn't have just, like, dropped a bag and kept going. Yeah. But regardless, reports were sent out to the media with a description of these two men thought to be involved. One man was wearing a Yankees ball cap, dark pants, and a burgundy Hollister sweatshirt. And the other one was wearing a green ball cap, jeans, and a black North Face jacket. And they were hoping someone's going to recognize these guys. We'll be able to figure this out really quick. But ultimately, it ended up taking seven months to capture the suspects. Wow. Now, because of the amount of money that had been taken, the threat using a weapon, and the employee essentially being taken as a hostage, FBI special agents were the ones that stepped up to help locate these dangerous criminals. Now, I am not exactly sure what led them to the group of four men. I have a theory. But once they were ultimately identified months later, they had left so much evidence behind. <laughs> And so, again, it's just another aspect of you planned this out seemingly somewhat well and then just totally messed it up. So I guess they were all working very average jobs at the time, not making a ton of money. So it was pretty curious when investigators were digging into their, you know, whereabouts and what they were doing around that time that both Jones and Liggins the following day used cash to purchase brand new vehicles in full. I knew it. <laughs> it's like they can't you can't it's like they can't help it no they're like oh this is burning a hole in my pocket yeah yeah oh my goodness yeah so absolutely no efforts to conceal what they had done at all or even slightly make themselves look less suspicious yeah and so already they're like okay we're definitely you know getting close to these guys and also since jones had been seen on the phone multiple times they're thinking, what if, you know, he was communicating with the men in the bathroom? And mm -hmm. so literally the most simple search warrant into their phone records proved all of that. So there had been multiple calls between Jones and Carter from the moment they entered the store, with the bulk of them being between 1114 and 1116. Mm -hmm. So like literally moments before they ran in and ransacked the entire cash room. So they basically had their men. They're like, you tried, you failed. <laughs> so on June 19th, 2013, they were all arrested and facing some pretty serious charges and all of them pleaded guilty, surprisingly. Now, I don't think they realized <laughs> the severity of what they did, though, because all four of them were charged with robbery under the Federal Hobbs Act. Okay. So... This is a part of an anti-racketeering law that was passed back in 1946. And essentially the law prohibits robbery of extortion or robbery or extortion that affects interstate or foreign commerce. And I think the biggest thing they nailed them under was it also prohibits individuals from making threats of violence, force, or fear to acquire property. Mm. And so they were able to nail them under this, and this typically carries a 20-year sentence along with a $250,000 fine. Wow. Wow. Not a good Black Friday for them. So Carter and Vaughn, who had held the employees hostage um, and actually physically robbed the target, were also charged each of them with using a firearm in the furtherance of a crime. And that adds on another potentially life sentence <laughs> to, I think, a minimum of seven years for that one. And so ultimately, Jones and Carter as well ended up receiving 10 years and 10 months in prison for their charges of the Federal Hobbs Act. Um, Jones also received three years of supervised release afterwards, and Carter received five years of supervised release. And Vaughn actually ended up in a much nastier situation because I don't think when they went into this and the planning of this that they thought that this was ever going to be investigated on a federal level. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I personally wouldn't have thought that, but 
the feds got involved this hobbs act is a serious thing and when the feds got involved and were digging up information on these men they ended up finding out that vaughn was involved in firearms trafficking like and a lot like a whole lot of different guns all sorts of crazy things and so he ended up with all of those charges as well wow. now ultimately for just the robbery itself he got a little more time than the rest of them he received 13 years um, and the getaway driver was only sentenced to five years of probation and all four of the men had to pay 54,000 in restitution Ooh. and the crazy thing to me about this is that i feel like we see like i'm almost thankful well i say that very lightly because I feel like most of the time when we think of crimes happening on Black Friday, we do think of like these silly things that happen um, or these accidents that end up being deadly. And I feel like never in my mind did I ever consider the idea that when I was Black Friday shopping that I could ever possibly be around a crime like that occurring. Yeah. yeah. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. And so it kind of scares me. <laughs> it kind of scares me because reading into all of the statistics of the most recent years and how this is becoming more commonly seen it's scary yeah absolutely you don't you, you don't know while you're uh, in there shopping that there's guys waiting in the bathroom that are going to rip the whole place off and they're armed well, yeah. and they're threatening employees i mean there's well and i mean how scary would it be too if you know it wasn't just involving employees you know they yeah. come and yeah. It's the whole store. You know, it's just, I feel like everything has become more and more scary over the past couple of years, but it's just absolutely crazy to me. And so I don't know why I'd never considered this when it came to like Black Friday crimes. Mm -hmm. I mean, I know we've seen really stupid things, you know, and other crimes occur, but this yeah. one kind of made me a little uneasy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, you only spend, you only spent 30 minutes in Target this year, right? So. Yeah. It, yeah. And look. I was honestly a little nervous. Because <laughs> you did the I'm research so, for this episode before you went? Yes. <laughs> yes. I'm not kidding. And well, I actually had um, last year something very scary happen on Black Friday. And it's just made me scared in general the holidays to go out in public. Yeah. Yeah. Last year, something really weird happened to where we were going to go out for Black Friday to our local mall. Mm -hmm. And... I will never forget like I wanted to get there at a certain time because I was like, I want to get there like before this, this or that, whatever. And I was being like anal about it. Yeah. And something ended up happening that like irritated me so badly, but it threw off our timeline by like 10 to 15 minutes. And finally, by the time we got to the mall, before we were even able to like enter, we were stuck in all this traffic. And I was thinking, oh, it's just Black Friday traffic. And all of a sudden I see people running everywhere. The store that I literally planned to go to, like just outside of it, there was a shooting, like a map. Mm. Oh, and I was like, reminder yeah. <laughs> to myself that sometimes things happen for a reason. And so, yeah, I don't know, you guys. I can deal with someone trying to pepper spray me <laughs> over a TV, but some of this organized crime and craziness happening lately, no thank you. Yeah. I have no part in it. I will do all my shopping online or I just won't shop at all. It's just getting next level. Mm -hmm. Well, and I mean, to be fair, that for me, the whole, like I remember being excited about going out mm -hmm. for Black Friday for like, oh, there's this particular video game I want to get or, or something like that with how easy it is to buy stuff online now it's really yep. just a matter of like oh i'm willing to wait for a day or two for it to arrive mm -hmm. so and i think i don't know i think cyber monday has kind of stolen the thunder yeah a little bit it sure has man and if we keep talking about these black friday stories like this danielle will never leave know. the house i sure won't man <laughs> i sure won't but i am very thankful that in this story no one was like physically harmed that could have gone yeah way 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 worse absolutely way worse so i'm super thankful for that and you know hopefully these men learned their lesson i was trying to look it up and see <laughs> if they'd ever like you know continue to get into any more yeah. criminal activity but i don't know but huge thank you to archives at fbi.gov patch.com newjersey.com nbc new york washington times and speed commerce for some of my lovely statistics <laughs> on all the money that targets losing <laughs> Yeah, that's really shocking too. Oh, 
a lot going on with that story. Um, but we've got more work to do. We've got another story to get to, and we're going to do it right after this short break. Every day can't be Black Friday, but with HelloFresh, you can still save some money. HelloFresh is cheaper than grocery store shopping and 25% less expensive than takeout. Are you running short on time? Look for HelloFresh's quick and easy options like 20 minute meals and easy cleanup dishes, my personal favorite, big on flavor and easy on effort. These time-saving solutions mean more time with friends and family around the holidays. Speaking of friends and family, what if you have picky eaters in your family? like Gordon Ramsay, the vegetarian over here. With HelloFresh, it's no problem. They have over 35 recipes available weekly, so there's something to please everyone. In my last HelloFresh box, we got the one pot pork and black bean chili, you guys. Melty Monterey Jack cheese on top of it. Literally like a giant warm hug. There's nothing better during this season. <laughs> no, we all need a giant warm hug for the mm -hmm. holidays. And you can get one with HelloFresh's festive eats, holiday inspired dinner recipes, seasonal add ons, even a three course offering, all designed to make holiday meals extra yummy and easier than ever. And they want to save you even more money this time of year. Big fan of that. Come on. Go to HelloFresh.com slash CrimeAfterCrime70 and use code CrimeAfterCrime70 for 70% off plus free shipping. Now that is Black Friday size savings. Go mm -hmm. to HelloFresh.com slash CrimeAfterCrime70 and use code CrimeAfterCrime70 for 70% off plus free shipping. Try America's number one meal kit this holiday season. All right, welcome back, you guys. Honestly, I feel like John is gonna get me on this one. This was a really hard research job. I feel like it's either really intense stories that I just- This is the speech she just... gives to win. This is, here she's no, doing it now. No, I'm not. <laughs> I No, I promise <laughs> I'm not. This was very, very difficult. This is a really hard research job. And just look at your face. Oh no, I'm scared. <laughs> Let me just remind everyone how she tortured me over this past month. Oh, the text, my, yes, the phone I calls, sure did. the dead roses. Dead roses. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Danielle. We'll see. We'll see. Now everyone knows. Danielle pointed it out. Look, a lot of the best Black Friday deals they're actually starting the night before. Mm -hmm. And Danielle, what deal could be better than buy none? get 2400 free <laughs> that's a pretty dang good deal that's a good deal isn't it that's a really good deal esquin wine and storage in seattle washington was both a high-end wine retailer selling bottles literally worth hundreds of dollars just for one bottle but it was also a wine storage location do you ever wish that you could have your own wine cellar danielle do you have yes, one i wish I would love one. Yeah. Well, Esquin offered their customers a way to protect their wine collection in one of 450 private wine lockers. Isn't that awesome? Could yeah, but like, I wouldn't want to have to make the trip to get it. Well, for people in that, Seattle, it's not that bad. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah seriously, I mean, people in Seattle, this is nothing. Yeah. You live in the area. It'd be a little different for you, uh, you know, if, if you had right. to go to Seattle to get your wine, that, that'd probably be a problem, Danielle. But <laughs> Anything past 10 minutes? <laughs> yeah. Uh, they advertised it as a secure, temperature-controlled space with a fully equipped fire sprinkler system and security system with alarm monitoring 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Customers even locked their wine locker using their own locks, so no one except them could access it. Sounds good, right? Yeah, sure does. So sounds like a lot for me, but you know. Nice and safe. Teach their own, man. Keep your wine bottle safe. Even the employees can't get into it. You're, it's your lock. Yeah. Well, on Black Friday, employees at Esquin showed up. But instead of the sweet smell of a Chardonnay, they were met with the smell of something else. The building was filling with natural gas. The fire department was called in and found that two gas lines had been cut in the ceiling. They shut off those lines, but employees noticed that some other things were off. The lenses on the security cameras had been spray painted over. The motion sensors had plastic coverings on them. Someone had obviously been in the wine storage and tried to cover their tracks by blowing the whole building up. Thankfully, 
that plan didn't seem to go well. And uh, we'll... Uh, that's a little extreme. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Clearly, the only way to take care of this is just blow the whole thing up. It might be a little insight into the personalities we're dealing with here, but we'll see. Well, I mean, if you're going to take the time to, you know, bust into a wine cellar like that, like I probably wouldn't even know that thing existed, mm -hmm. you know? Mm hmm. Takes a special person, John. Well, luckily, Danielle, whoever spray painted the cameras. Oh, they missed one. <laughs> and it showed what was going on. Esquin <laughs> issued a release saying, quote, On Thanksgiving evening, criminals broke into Esquin wine merchants and stole a large quantity of wine from our personal storage lockers. The sophistication and timing of the break-in indicates that the criminals had carefully planned their crime for some time. They were right. Two men had a plan. It was literally written in a journal with a big title on it that said the plan. The plan. You're joking. <laughs> no, it literally was. You're just. <laughs> oh, boy. This wasn't going to be a simple smash and grab. The two men would be working for 13 hours straight, trying to take as much as they could before employees came into work on Black Friday. And think about it, Danielle. Thanksgiving night perfect time for a heist. Everyone else is in one of two places, either at home with their loved ones or at a store trying to lock down an early Black Friday deal on a Roomba. In that 13-hour heist window, the two men made off with 200 cases of wine. Now, each, wow. each case holds 12 bottles. And remember, the money amounts we were talking about here, those bottles averaged over $200 each. It's estimated that they stole six hundred and forty eight thousand dollars in wine now the staff at esquin they checked hey they had internal cameras but they also had exterior cameras I'm telling so, you these people don't play games with their wine yeah so they checked those but two trucks were parked in spots that literally blocked the view of those two cameras soon the customers of Esquin were learning about what had happened. Brian Fung was one customer that was actually there on the morning of Black Friday, probably wanting to get some of his selection yeah. out for celebrating on the weekend. He was there when everyone was figuring out that there had been a robbery. On WineBerserkers.com, he posted, if you're, <laughs> you love that name. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a wine berserker. Yeah, that was pretty funny. <laughs> he, he posted, if you're a wine storage customer at Esquin, you need to go check on your wine. There was a major theft there. I've lost thousands of dollars. Another customer named Kevin Hamilton noted the whole thing's a total mess. I lost thousands too, and there are going to be a lot of losses from the looks of it. Lieutenant Greg Schmidt with the Seattle Police Department told the press, evidence is leading us to believe the two suspects were common thieves. They're not wine connoisseurs in any way, shape, or form. But... The oh. Seattle Police Department wouldn't have to put in too much effort to crack the case thanks to that one camera that the crooks forgot to paint. When employees watched the footage back, they recognized one of the men. He was a customer. He had recently rented a wine locker. I knew it had to be that. And they had his address on file. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Only in Seattle. You guys, quite literally, this would never happen anywhere else. Only with a special criminal, Danielle. And there's there's a lot of aspects to this that we're going to learn about. 34-year-old Samuel Harris owned a plumbing company. But during the day, on December 2nd, he was at home when a SWAT team broke in. They found him in his basement, filling up a black bag with personal items, seemingly getting ready to leave, but they put a stop to that. Also found in that bag was a list of types of wine, descriptions about them and their values, but no stolen wine was found in his home. Investigators did also find correspondence with a wine dealer and in the wine storage locker that Harris had rented, you know, the one that he rented, they opened it up and went and looked. Mm -hmm. There were shipping labels in there with the wine dealer's address. Seattle PD contacted that dealer and he told them that he had dealt with Harris previously back in April or May when he bought approximately $100,000 worth of wine from him. He said Harris had reached out again just two days after Thanksgiving, offering mm -hmm. to sell a few hundred cases of wine for pennies on the dollar, $125,000 in total. 
while Seattle PD had nailed one of the suspects, there was still another one on the loose. And the big question, where's the wine? Yeah. As they processed Harris's home, they found a receipt from Lowe's with some items that caught their attention. Gloves, black spray paint, black plastic. Seemed like items that might have been used in the wine heist. Mm -hmm. Investigators went to that Lowe's and they pulled the security camera footage from the transaction. They saw Harris and a former employee of his, 36-year-old Luke Fessing. Police had just found the second suspect and soon he was in custody as well. They continued searching for the stolen wine. Esquin even offered a $20,000 reward for its safe return. And it seems like that was probably a good move. Two weeks after the heist, two security guards that worked at a storage rental facility less than a mile from Esquin decided, hmm, maybe we should look through our security camera footage from that night. See if, if we have something that might net us this $20,000. Oh, boy. Jim White and Terry Ottaway Jr. found in the footage that an SUV made about nine trips into their facility that night. Oh, boy. That's a lot. It's a lot of wine, though. So, yeah. Nine trips. Seemed suspicious enough, so they notified Esquin, who told the police. Soon, a search warrant was issued and the storage unit was searched. In it, numerous cases of wine. Esquin owner Chuck Lefebvre, and I hope I pronounced Makes that sense. right, <laughs> said, There was a big enough pile in there, and they were confident they got most of it. And it looks to me they got most of it based on what we know about the heist. So Esquin made good on their offer and those two guards that looked through the security footage they wound up splitting the twenty thousand oh, dollar reward that makes me happy yeah i feel like sometimes you hear about rewards like that and then like something comes out of it and then you never think to look back and check <laughs> yeah be like hey did they like actually get the reward for that yeah and i don't know if that's a failure of like the rewards not happening or just media not reporting on that type of stuff while relieved that the wine was found, Chuck was still concerned that the wine could have been ruined if it wasn't was stored properly. Say, yeah, because yeah, I know that some storage facilities have like the temperature control. Yeah. And people in their wines, man, my dad used to have like a wine chest refrigerator thing in one of our houses and like. Oh, yeah. It, you don't mess with it. Yeah. 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 Thankfully, you hit the nail on the head. The storage unit was also climate controlled. But. This whole discovery created a new headache for Seattle PD. Lieutenant Schmidt told the press, detectives need to photograph and document each bottle, enter it oh into boy. evidence, and then we need to find the owner of each bottle. They need to tell us what they're missing. We have to check that against the evidence we recovered, and then they have to identify their wine and prove ownership. How do you do that? I mean, you have to have original paperwork for when you purchased it. And even then, it's not like there's a serial number. Like, I don't I don't know, because listen to this next point. A victim may tell us they had a bottle of Washington Chardonnay in storage, but we may have hundreds of those. So especially if you had the same type of wine that was taken from numerous different owners, how would you ever know? I mean... It sounds like a gigantic nightmare. There is a year on the wine typically yeah so i mean i guess that would get you kind of in the range but there's still a chance that if you had another owner that had the same year that maybe you wouldn't get the exact same bottle back but yeah um but now you've got the cops Ugh. handling all this and they're also saying hey by the way we have to handle that stuff delicately because they have to make sure they don't damage the wine as they're processing mm -hmm. it and that they're storing it properly so it turned into this whole thing for the police department as well Chuck said the thieves targeted, targeted 15 victims and cherry picked the wine that they wanted. So contrary to what the Piatle, yeah, Piatle, they knew what they were doing. The Piatle, <laughs> the Piatle PD. <laughs> I like that. I kind of like it too. Uh, yeah, contrary to what Lieutenant Schmidt said, uh, yeah. they actually did know something. But keep in mind, when they found Harris, he also had that list with the types of wines and the amounts and all that stuff. I don't know if he wrote that list after he stole the stuff or if. Yeah, I mean, I'm kind of surprised, though, that the police genuinely believed that it was someone that didn't know a lot about wine, because I feel like you would have to know a lot about wine to understand that that was even something that could potentially benefit you. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, you would have to have some sort of knowledge there. Yeah. Not a random person's not going to be like, you know what I'm going to do today to make some money? <laughs> well, and it could also go like... I think either way, if you're stealing wine in this way, you're going to do okay because yeah. people that are paying for a storage location 
like you know it's not going to be two buck chuck that they've got in there it's no, going to be like decent not. wines but to maximize on you committing this crime you would hope that he would be able to tell the difference between a $150 bottle versus a $400 bottle. And yeah, exactly. I don't know. Um, I don't know if he had that knowledge or it's weird, Daniel, because I ran into this other crime, almost the exact same setup, two guys robbing wine, but this one happened over in uh, San Francisco in California. As a matter of fact, they were trying to attach, they thought that Harris might've been responsible for that one as well. I'm just um, laughing because these places just are not at all surprising for me. Yeah. For these crimes to have occurred at. Yeah. But in that case, like, I don't know. I, I just, I'm just getting, I'm wondering if there's something about these dealers that they're supposedly going and selling this wine to. Like, are these dealers giving them the information about, hey, if you happen to get into this type of wine or, hmm, you know, who collects a lot of that type of wine? It just, it seems it's like It's like art almost. I feel like there yeah. could be like that potential there. There's some level of intel here that is making me uncomfortable, like to the mm -hmm. point of I feel like there's more planning in this. And maybe yeah. the guys that are committing these robberies aren't the ones that are actually doing that level of planning. I feel like there's yeah. something else at play there. But um, I don't know. I don't know. No, I can totally see that, though, because it's like, hey, um, you know here's this place where people store their wines there's potential for this this and this to be there how about you guys go and rent out a unit and yeah case the joint figure out exactly. your approach um yeah so chuck was also saying that they didn't clear out entire lockers they picked wine that would be easy to resell uh, he told the press this was something out of oceans 11. the plan mm -hmm. was extremely elaborate well planned fortunately poorly executed yeah <laughs> well now, what does Chuck mean by that? I mean, honestly, Danielle, they missed one camera, right? Yeah. But outside of that, they moved it to a climate-controlled area within mm -hmm. a mile of where they were. I mean, all that seems like it was executed pretty well. But more analysis shows that we're dealing with some less than brilliant criminals here, as hilariously outlined by SeattleMet.com. Oh, boy. The two men literally wrote down the details of their robbery in a journal and even titled it The Plan. <laughs> but they left The Plan in Harris's car. Where oh, that's good. Yeah, where police would eventually find it. <laughs> police would also find a kit used for copying keys, a book titled Thinking About Crime. You're joking. <laughs> no. How do you find these things, John? Good grief. <laughs> and... In Harris's house, they found computer printouts of articles, online articles with fun titles like how to commit the perfect crime and is it accidental fire or arson? Oh my goodness, y'all. <laughs> Look, this day and age, do people not realize that anything you search on the internet is going to come back and bite you? <laughs> no joke. And then like, don't print on. it out and leave it around <laughs> no. your house with your Lowe's receipt that gets the second guy. No one will connect these dots. <laughs> the men rented a locker at the location to allow them to case the joint, but they left shipping labels in their locker with their wine dealer buddy's address on them. They, oh, man. They prepared by buying all the supplies they needed for the heist at Lowe's, spray paint, gloves, black plastic sheeting, but... They kept the receipt. I mean, honestly, was there a chance that they were going to have to return something? Like, why would you keep the receipt? Throw out the receipt. If they even ask you, do you want your receipt or not? I'd be yeah. like, no. No. I don't. <laughs> <laughs> Take that and put it in your trash can. Yeah. Remember oh how, uh, remember about the external cameras, how they wound yeah. up useless? Mm -hmm. They rented the two moving trucks and positioned them to cleverly block the view of those external cameras. But you... they left the trucks there overnight, drawing the attention of building management who had the trucks towed and they rented the trucks. I wonder whose name came up on the rentals. <laughs> I will forever and always be so shocked to see the amount of effort put into these crimes and then like the dumb things that are just overlooked, like things that there's no way you oh, I'm so frustrated. Oh, so we know that they painted over the internal surveillance cameras, but they yep. missed that one, of course. They uh, cleverly removed the secure storage doors by popping the hinges on them so they could easily put them back into place. 
Danielle, outside of the stuff that the employees noticed, like with the cameras being covered yeah. up and all that, no one knew that they had got into the place. Oh, no. I. And they didn't even clean out entire lockers. So, like, there's some aspects of this where it's like, wow, like, that was yeah, kind of smart. And that, like, could have really delayed the discovery mm -hmm. of anything being stolen at all. But then, like, well, you spray painted over the lenses. They're going to notice that. Oh, you put plastic over the motion sensors. They're going to notice that. Like, it's so weird. There's some steps that are really smart. And then for every one of those, well, there's another one. All I have to say is, is whatever book and articles he was reading was giving him bad advice. <laughs> Well, half good. Yeah, half bad <laughs> advice. Um, of course, they uh, they put this stolen booze into a Cadillac SUV, which was the getaway vehicle, but it had limited capacity. So that's why they had to make nine round trips to the storage location. And that SUV was caught on surveillance cameras because there's other cameras in the town. Like yeah. all you need to do is find a neighboring business and be like, okay, what's this SUV? Oh, grief. Uh, not to mention, we know that the security guys at the other location saw this vehicle coming in. Uh, the SUV registered directly to Harris. So all they had to do was get the license plate and they knew who owned it. Uh, they planned to completely cover over their tracks by blowing the whole place up, but they tampered with a natural gas line, which first of all could have easily killed them both. Yeah. Uh, it didn't go off. So even for the purposes of their plan, it didn't help. And then ultimately the smell is what alerted employees when they came in the next morning to the fact that something was off. Like if it wasn't for that gas being there, maybe it would have taken them a while to notice that the cameras and the motion sensors had been tampered with. Yeah, and I feel like if that had gone through the way they hoped it would, I don't think they would have been caught. Yeah. Uh, senior Deputy Prosecutor Alexandra Voorhees noted that if they hadn't severed the gas line, employees wouldn't have smelled the natural gas and the robbery might have not even been discovered for some time. Yeah. So uh, she also said in their efforts to cover their tracks, they made it so we could solve this crime. Exactly. I'm like It's like she heard you. And she I love said it. Exact same things. <laughs> Uh, a fire expert from the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms, and Explosives said that if the natural gas had ignited, that explosion could have cratered a block or two. Absolutely. With that amount of alcohol in there, this is wild to me. Yeah. And of course, one of the biggest things that I still don't understand, they stole over $600,000 of wine and their big plan was to sell it for 125000 <laughs> Yeah, I don't get that. And there's two of them. Mm -hmm. So if they, even if they pull this off, they get the 125,000, they split it. They're going to wind up with a little over 62,000 each. Mm -hmm. And I did a little research. That's about the average that a plumber in Seattle makes in a year. I'm telling you what, <laughs> someone suckered them into doing that. <laughs> it really seems like it. I, I mean, I genuinely think so because that just... If you think about it again, that's such like a niche thing, like being a wine connoisseur. And you wouldn't know how to resell wine. And I feel like, what is someone going to do with it? And the chances are going to be like, oh, I'm going to steal all this wine. How can I get rid of it? Wow, there's a wine dealer out there. Like, and I don't even know there are wine dealers. What is a wine dealer? This guy's a plumber. Like, Yeah, he, like I just don't believe it for yeah, a minute that there was not someone else involved. He's a working man. He's, mm -hmm. he's got a former employee of his that's helping him with this. I don't know that yeah. this is a guy that has the type of lifestyle where he's no. going to be popping a $250 bottle of wine. It just no. doesn't seem like it. But And so I'm sure to them, it might have sounded like a great deal. They might have thought that's, they might have had no idea how much money it was actually worth. I mean, obviously I he's not, his business is not like, you know, he's got five different teams doing work all over Seattle or something like that. I mean, mm -hmm. they're trying to steal $125,000 for two of them yeah. like this. Now, what were they going to do after their big score? Well, there was some of that written in the plan also. Change appearance, pack belongings, huh. obtain international driver's license. Apparently, Harris's plan was he was going to split the country and Just live out his wildest leave. dreams on about 60 grand. <laughs> I don't know how far that's going to get him, but. Uh, not very far. No. See, I'm telling you, I don't think someone like that could have planned this. <laughs> no. Harris and Thessing were booked into the King County Jail for burglary and attempted arson. Bail was set at $500,000 each. Harris 
pleaded guilty to attempted arson, burglary, and theft. But in addition to the burglary at Esquin, he would get another charge tacked on. He also pleaded guilty to stealing $250,000 worth of wine from a woman who hired him to build a wine storage cellar back in May of 2013. Oh, good grief. So remember when they talked to the dealer and the dealer's like, yeah, I bought wine from this guy before earlier this year? Stolen from a woman when he built her her locker. And in that I case... I wondered about that. In that case, took him a while. She basically has, like, this is what I'd expect for someone that collects wine. She has an auditor. Like, she has someone that comes in and, like, does inventory on her stuff. So That's it, crazy. It took a couple months until they noticed. They were like, you know, yeah, seems like we're missing some. Let, let, yeah. So uh, he stole that wine as well and took took a charge on that. So uh, Thessing also pleaded guilty. Uh, Harris was sentenced by King County Superior Court Judge Julie Spector to nine years in prison. Thessing received five years. Harris was handed a stiffer sentence because not only was he the mastermind of the caper, but he was the one to actually cut the gas lines, which was determined mm -hmm. by that one little pesky camera. They could tell in terms of the timing of when he walked back and forth that he was the one that had access to where those yeah. gas lines were cut. Uh, in the proceedings, Harris and Thessing blamed mental illness and depression for what they mm. did. But Judge Spector told them, the court sees plenty of people who are depressed and they don't commit crimes. Yeah. So news articles came out with amazing titles like the not so great wine heist of 2013 and local plumbers plead guilty in thoroughly bungled wine heist. However, this heist also comes up on lists of several of the greatest food heists of all time. Seriously? Yeah. So I don't know. I To me, it's how bad they were as criminals. It kind of makes the story great. But other yeah, people, exactly. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Uh, so thank you, Seattle Times, SeattleMet.com, Oregon Live, KIRO7, QFOX13, SPDBlotter.Seattle.gov, MyNorthwest.com, Courant.com, and WineEconomist.com for information contributing to today's story. I forgot to get Wine Berserker in there, but thank you, Wine I was Berserker. just wondering about that because <laughs> that genuinely is fantastic. Look, I love, I love a good wine. Mm. I do. But that's absolutely wild to me. And I actually find their choice of day strange. Yeah, why? Why? When would you have done it? Sorry, my cold is like taking me out. No, Anyways, okay. I feel like it's strange only because there's very specific times where I feel like you break out a good wine. Mm -hmm. And like a big Thanksgiving meal, I feel like is one of those. So I feel like that was yes. almost risky. Because, I mean, first of all, if your goal is to get as many expensive, nice wines as you can, chances are a handful of those have already been taken yeah. out of those lockers and people are using them for Thanksgiving. And I don't know. And That's also, like point. you said, lots of people would probably be going to their lockers for that weekend. You've got family in town for a long time. And so... I just feel like it's so strange that's when they chose to do it because I feel like the activity at yeah. the, the storage facility is probably a lot higher than normal. Well, I think the storage facility actually had hours, though. I don't think you could just yeah. enter it whenever you wanted. Um, based on some other stuff I saw, it looks like they got a copy of the master key. I just couldn't find how. Yeah. Um, so somehow they got the key that allowed them access to where everything else was. Um, and that's why they, they did it overnight essentially yeah but to your well, point yeah like, people would notice a lot faster during that time period it's kind of a good point that's kind of a good point um like, i don't know that just stuck out to me it's kind of a weird choice in time yeah so and again, honestly they're very bizarre things yeah they if they did. were going to do this overnight they could have done it whenever overnight like mm -hmm. maybe they thought because of the long holiday weekend but they would have known that they were open the next day like, yeah hey. isn't it weird to you i think it's, it's just, weird it's just not well thought out it, no. it's weird it was like there's such good focus on some aspects and then mm -hmm. there's like just a blind spot, a huge blind spot to everything else. It's always so fascinating to watch how that works out. And it's such a common theme in almost every single crime. Doesn't it's it so it weird sound, to me. but doesn't it sound like some other person is giving them the information? Mm -hmm. Like, doesn't it sound I like... I strongly feel like that's the case. Yeah. Like, doesn't this sound like, um, hmm, I'm going to tell you guys how to do this. Because yeah. if, if you're actually, I have to imagine, like, in your story, 
there's an element of improvisation that's happening. Yeah. Those guys don't have everything they need to get it done on their way in, but they're discovering it as they're in it. Yeah. Here, it's almost back to this point about their notebook yep. and the plan. Yeah. They've planned out certain aspects and they're running those things kind of well, but the stuff that is improvisational, like I bet blowing up the building wasn't part of the plan. Yeah. That stuff is just completely falling on its face. Um, which is, it really leads me to believe that there's, there's another brain that's involved there. There's but. a sneaky wine dealer out there. <laughs> I kind of think so. Yeah. I don't know. Well, what? yeah, we'll see what happens. Remember Danielle's harassment. I, I've been, I know, look, I have the worst <laughs> cold. I'm living in my own karma. <laughs> oh, okay. okay. <laughs> this alone is like taking me out this episode. <laughs> Well, we can almost let you go, Danielle, but we have to get through a couple of extra stories real quick. Why don't oh, absolutely. You, why don't you get us started off on that? All right, you guys. Now, some deals on Black Friday just really aren't the kind that you would imagine. Okay. Black Friday 2017, officers in Middleborough, Massachusetts, executed a search warrant at a Fairfield Inn and Suites. It was the middle of the day, like 1 p.m., you guys, okay? So most people are busy shopping, you know, sleeping, eating leftovers. But 45-year-old John Jones was setting up a shop of his own. He wasn't selling TVs. Detectives burst into his room to find him literally setting up displays of ecstasy and cocaine and Percocet and Xanax. Whoa. <laughs> Just like the whole nine yards. John Jones was catering to a very different kind of Black Friday shopper. Wow. And he was ultimately arrested for trafficking drugs. That's unbelievable. Like you're going to invite people in and act like it's a store in there and have all these different displays and stuff. Like, what if people start grabbing it's stuff and just... Hilarious to me. <laughs> not well thought out, John Jones. No, it's not. But also, like, what... Like, I don't know. There's something funny to me about, like, making... Dealing drugs, like, festive. <laughs> <laughs> I just oh, have, Oh, like... <laughs> yeah. He was having a Black Friday sale. Ah. Yes, he was literally, like, just... <laughs> what kind of drug dealer does that? Like, I would be so interested to see what kind of person he is because yeah. it just sounds hilarious to me. <laughs> he just wanted a little BOGO, a little yeah. buy one, get one free. Absolutely. Oh, goodness. Well, this is a story that sounds like it's from Florida. Oh, boy. But it's actually from from Canada back in 2016. Oh. So people were Big lined difference. up. Yeah, a little bit of a difference there. People were lined up at an Adidas store trying to get into the raffle to win the chance to buy a pair of Yeezy Boost 350 V2s. Mm. Now, when it comes to Yeezys, tensions can run high. And the crowd started getting restless. A few small fights broke out, but one man took it to the next level. Ripping off his shirt, he undid his belt and pulled it from its hoops. He was now armed with a whip. <laughs> Like a shirtless and likely drunken Indiana Jones, he swang that whip around. He was like clearing the street, Danielle. There's literally footage of this. He is swinging it around. Unfortunately, he actually did hit someone. And oh, no. the way he was using the whip, he was holding the end without the buckle. So the other end had the buckle on it. He clipped some kid with the buckle and that guy had to go get uh, staples. To Good close grief. up yeah, his I was wound. About to say, yeah. You get hit with that. Big problems. Yeah. Uh, thankfully, someone was able to jump on the back of the shirtless man and get him in a chokehold until the authorities arrived <laughs> and took him into custody. I can't find any details on why he went nuts, but I assume it's because but he, he did. <laughs> he did. No, there's footage. I know he did. Uh, but it's either probably because he ran out of maple syrup or he didn't yeah. have enough ketchup for his macaroni and cheese. Probably. Gosh, you just keep making me hungry today. <laughs> I do. Which says a lot because I don't know about ketchup on macaroni and cheese. <laughs> you know, I just often wonder what comes over people during Black Friday. And I feel like this leads me to my next one. I, I always refer to Black Friday as the purge, right? Mm -hmm. Because people just seem to get this overwhelming feeling that they can just do whatever they want to. There's, I want someone to do a study on it. I feel like this goes across things like vacations, um, all holidays, field trips for kids. There's like this mentality that like kicks into everyone's, you know, 
I don't know what it is. It needs to be studied. But Black Friday 2019 in good old North Carolina. (laughs) Nightdale, North Carolina. Authorities began receiving calls about a strange man doing very suspicious things in his car parked outside of Coles. Okay. I've never seen a more North Carolina statement. Coles is awful, but everyone here loves it. So when police arrive, they immediately smell marijuana as they approach this car in question. Okay. And they find 28-year-old Tyleek Shadu Little just chilling in his car, totally naked, with the windows rolled down. All right. Yeah. And so authorities are like, it's Black Friday (laughs) in the (laughs) middle of the day. You're in a shopping center. You're naked in a shopping center. Yeah. What are you doing? And so they're like, get out of the car and get dressed. And do you know what he does? Slowly drives away. (laughs) No. 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 I don't know where he thought he was going. Okay. Because all he did was slowly drive between two nearby buildings (laughs) and parked there instead. I don't know if he thought he was invisible. What? I don't know what. I don't know if there was something mixed into his marijuana. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Wow. But. Obviously, police just casually followed him. <laughs> <laughs> Slowly followed him. The trail of ch- uh, Cheetos and, yeah, yeah. and Oreos. And <laughs> they ended up arresting him for indecent exposure, resisting arrest, and marijuana possession. No one knows to this day why he was just naked in the middle of this Coles parking lot. Well, it's because he, like, he was couldn't invisible. Answer that to anyone. He was invisible. He had- if he had clothes on, they'd see him. I genuinely think that may have been what he believed because he had clothes in his car. They were able to like get him to put sweatpants on in his car. Yeah. He got so stoned. He thought he was invisible. You've never had that happen, Danielle? (laughs) No, I can't say that I have. He did. He thought he was invisible. He was having a great time. And when I tell you, that's probably one of the most North Carolina stories I've ever heard. Mm. I'm going to have to come visit someday. It's literally a mess here. (laughs) Well, we have talked about it on the previous episode, uh, but stampedes oh. are a huge problem on Black Friday. But yeah. one Walmart in California thought that they had it all figured out. Now, back in 2008, they decided, okay, we'll just stay open all night because then you don't have a stampede. There's no big lock them at the door, open the doors and wait for everyone to run in. The only problem was as they were preparing for the blowout deals that were supposed to start on Black Friday at 5 a.m., they were wheeling out these pallets of shrink-wrapped items into the stores, and guess what happened? People went nuts. Mm -hmm. (laughs) They were ripping at the items, fighting with each other. The staff literally had to call in the police to clear out the whole store. But the the customers didn't leave. (laughs) Like little Black Friday zombies, they banged (laughs) on the front glass. Me in. You're joking. Let me in. They tried to sneak in through the gardening section. Let me in. <laughs> what kind of crazy world do we live in? Danielle, the cops had to stay for several more hours. The deals were just too good. That's absolutely absurd, John. Look, I know I'm like very old fashioned, but like consumerism and (laughs) buying all these things why does it make everyone so crazy like the psychological aspect of all of this is so wild to me yeah can you think let me in in. can you think back through your life like i mean your entire life yeah and tell me about the deal you got on black friday that was just so crazy you still remember it? it was like the best thing that ever happened to you none granted i also have never been a big black black friday person i think even in the last episode i mentioned how i think black friday is just one big scam you know like and I, so i get i don't get it <laughs> i get in my news feed like you know because i look into tech stuff a little bit and i'll yeah. get like oh black friday deals on this laptop or something and i'll look at it and i'm like oh wow like a 300 hundred dollar laptop but then you look into mm-hmm. the specs on it and you're like oh Mm, yeah, that's yep. that's a three hundred dollar laptop. Like exactly, I've never seen some type of super amazing, unforgettable deal. I don't have one of those in my life. Do you guys no. have one? If you do, tell us about it in the comments. Because I'm I'm just I'm at a loss. 
I want to hear well, about the best deal that you guys have found. Exactly. Because John and I were even talking. Like, w was there a deal this year that everyone was freaking out over? Because I feel like most years there's like one thing that everyone's losing it over. Yeah. What Not is this year? What is the big holiday thing? Like, I don't, I don't know what it is this year. There's no new iPhone. <laughs> Danielle's face is going to blow up. <laughs> Are you okay? Yes, I promise I am trying to hang on here. <laughs> yeah, she's keeping she's keeping it together. We're almost at the end. Oh, I don't know. Yeah. I don't know if there's anything worth all that craziness. I mean, there is this exciting element to it, but I guess I guess not anything that's worth what we know happens. <laughs> I mean, if, you know, if, if I want to get in a mosh pit, I guess. Yeah, you can either go to a concert where that happens or you wait for Black Friday. Exactly. Danielle. Who's going to win this month? I'm pretty sure it's going to be you. We're just going to flat out say no, that. Oh, no. I don't think I, so. I don't think so. I definitely liked your story. I liked your story, too. Because how on earth did they think they were going to pull that off? I genuinely think they put way too much faith in their last minute blowing up the wine store plan. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh. But... Ultimately, it's not up to John or I. It is up to you guys. You guys get to vote on who told the best. And this is important, you guys. The best Black Friday Crimes Part 2. Do you remember who won last year? Or not last year, but when we last did it? I don't. I don't. I'm not We're gonna sure. We're going to have to figure that out. Yeah, but I'll bring that up on next month's episode. I'll, I'll make sure that we have that. Yeah. Something could hang in the balance here. Someone could steal away a win. Well, and if... Like... If the same person doesn't win from last time, mm -hmm. are we going to have to do a Black Friday Crimes Part 3 to try to find the winner? <laughs> <laughs> Probably not. You can vote on the Twitter account over at, at @crimeafterpod for the first seven days after the episode drops. Or you can also head over to www.crimeaftercrimepodcast.com and vote there. We also always have a link in the description box below and you can still click the little letter I. At crimeaftercrimepodcast.com, you can find all the links you'll ever need, including where to find more content by Danielle and myself, how to suggest show topics, join our Patreon, shop our Teespring store, and of course, vote. Oh, no, you're not voting anymore. The voting is closed. Yeah, but the voting is closed. we still do have a spot or two open for topics. So if you guys have some topics that you think we need to hear about, get them in there. Yes, please. Also, big thank you, as always, to our patrons. You guys, we have so much fun over there. You get a po bonus Patreon special segment monthly, and it's a lot of fun. You get to learn a lot about John and I, plus patrons get a personal shout out in an upcoming Patreon special. Don't forget, you can come and meet us, plus attend our final episode at CrimeCon Orlando in September of 2023. Come on, you guys. Come and meet up with us. It's our big finale. It means a lot to John and I. We would love to see you guys there. So how do you get your name on the guest list and a bunch of free crime after crime swag, which is usually awesome. Just mm -hmm. saying. Visit CrimeCon.com and buy a standard CrimeCon pass today using our code CrimeAfterCrime with no spaces. And then you email your receipt to CrimeAfterCrime at LordAndArts.com. That's CrimeAfterCrime at L-O-R-D-A-N-A-R-T-S dot com. Honestly, I will say the sooner the better, though, because we do have a limited number of seats and swag and we don't want you guys to miss out. Yeah. Last time we did have some people that couldn't get in because they didn't get it in in time. Yeah. So be sure to jump on that. Next episode, we will be back with an original topic suggested by you wonderful people. One that we're both super excited about. Mm -hmm. Blame the paranormal. <laughs> I like this topic. I really like this topic. Yes. But if anyone watches my personal YouTube channel, you already know that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I am so fascinated by it. So Crimes it's going to be a good one. The paranormal gets blamed for some reason. Mm -hmm. like, yes. It's like a common theme in my house. I'm like, oh, I didn't break that. That was the ghost. The ghost did it. Farm <laughs> ghost. The farm ghost. <laughs> Look, real thing. Not lying. All right. <laughs> the show is produced and hosted by myself, Daniel Hallen, and the amazing John Lorden. If you enjoyed today's episode, please rate or review us on whichever platform you found us on. Thank you. Have a great month, you guys, and we will see you guys again soon on Crime After Crime.